Uh, I'm Aaron Johnson, uh, the Executive Director of AIPG, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's talk uh, by Dr. Abani Samal on the international, international nature of the mineral industry and geosciences. Before we begin, a couple of very quick items. First, we will be recording this webinar. I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Samal, please put them in the chat. We'll try to address those. And if you need a certificate for the CEUs for today's presentation, also uh, put that in the chat along with your name requesting that certificate. We will get that out to you as quickly as we can. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abani Samal. He's a CPG and a fellow of the SEG, as well as being a registered member of SME. Uh, he is a ge uh, geologist and geostatician by training uh, with master's and a PhD. He's got uh, work in chromite exploration along with expertise in gold, silver, copper, lead, zinc, iron ore, diamonds, and rare earth elements. And he has worked worldwide for the last 25 years. I'm really excited to hear what he has to tell us about the international nature of the minerals industry and the geosciences. Uh, Dr. Samal, thank you for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, AIPG, for hosting me. Um, can you all hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. Um, um, thanks for, for that introduction. Um, yes, today's topic is uh, on international nature of the mineral industry and geosciences. Like uh, Mr. Aaron said, uh, this is my um, kind of a one slide bio here. Um, I have a master's degree from India. Um, and then also another master's program I completed in year 2000 from Imperial College of London. And my PhD was from SIU Carbondale. Before I came to US, I did work for uh, about six years. Like uh, Mr. Aaron said, uh, I worked in an exp exploration and mining project, uh, chromite mining project in India. As you know, India is one of those countries where chromite and bauxite type of minerals uh, occur and that we don't find here in, in the United States. Um, I have worked, I started my uh, you know, career in industry in, in January, 1996. So you, you, you may wanna see that, you know, it's roughly about 26 years now, but I did actually take some time off to do my academics and, and research also. Um, um, my specializations are uh, mineral exploration, and resource estimation. Many of you uh, may have actually seen me doing uh, talks on, on, on the trainings and, and the work in the geostatistics. Yes, I'm a trained geostatistician. Uh, that's kind of my technical um, part of it. Um, I have, uh, I also, uh, work-wise, I do, uh, or we have a group of people who work under GeoGlobal um, company brand, and uh, we provide services to in mineral industry worldwide. Um, my personal commodity experience uh, is all kind of metals. Uh, I have, I'm not a lithium expert, um, not a coal expert. You can see that, you know, I am a, a QP, a uh, qualified person or a competent person, depending on the uh, jurisdiction where you come from. I do maintain my uh, CPG status with AIPG. Thanks AIPG for that. And also registered member of SME. I'm also active with vari on um, various uh, societies. The, the list is there. Only the ones I'm more active or uh, give a lot of time. That is, I'm also a fellow of SME. Uh, I'm also a fellow of SEG. I do give some time to GSA and International Association of Mathematical Geologists. And I'm, I do serve on uh, editorial uh, board of two scientific journals and a couple of uh, industry magazines. Today, what I'm gonna present as most of the data is coming from you know, various agencies and companies, you know, their analysts and uh, also World Bank and basically various sources. These are not my data, rather have compiled all the information to make a case here. Um, um, this is coming from uh, MEC, Mineral Education Council, uh, which is a part of SME Foundation. Uh, if you know what SME is, Society for Mining Engineering, Mining Metallurgy and Exploration, um, the largest uh, professional society in the, in the entire world. Um, I, I must mention that SME and AIPG work together uh, in, um, on the technical sides. Um, now, 
you may have seen that we call it, you know, uh, mineral baby. Uh, this is what we need. Um, you know, every every child born in America will need this much of uh, metal in, uh, or commodity in his lifetime. I just highlight their iron ore, um, that much material every uh, American needs. Then the other one is bauxite. Not many times we talk about it actually, um, but these are the commodities uh, you won't see uh, much being discussed today because when we talk about battery minerals, electrical minerals, but these are the commodities always come into play without those. We don't, you cannot even think about transmission of energy. The other commodities, of course, the to me, it's my personal opinion, it's kind of king of all the commodities uh, is copper, copper and iron ore. Without that, we cannot think of actually even living our daily life today. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, coming from um, IEA. What it shows that the, the demand for source of energy is changing. Uh, today, if you look at 2020 data, where we, we are in, in uh, you know, um, we are going to actually, by 2040, uh, there are two different types of uh, uh, estimate, estimates there. The, the more um, conservative one is it will be fourfold by 2040. What will that mean? You know, these are various sources of energy. So basically what we're saying here is, well, there will be actually some blend of uh, energy uh, coming from coal and natural gas, but there will be other commodities too coming here. Um, you know, we talk about battery sources and wind and, you know, other renewable energy, but there will always be a blend. But what that mix of the blend is going to be is my opinion, really, we do not know yet. There's always a projection which keeps changing, which is very dynamic. Um, but keep that in mind. When, um, when actually we talk about the, the demand is going to be fourfold, um, remember, this chart doesn't include the steel and aluminum. And that's what I know, I keep stressing, look, you know, we always think about um, generating energy, but without the uh, infrastructure, without the uh, metals that we need for transmission, and, you know, we just, this, uh, you know, generated energy is useless. So you have to bring aluminum, steel, and copper is all, always there, and, and other associated elements into, into the discussion all the time. Um, if that is the case, um, this this is actually, actually uh, this morning's uh, actually uh, I, I, what I found out is that um, oh okay um, in um, in it is projected that from today um, uh, it is going to be uh, today actually the twenty twenty two we have only three uh, or four battery cell manufacturing capability. Now, and we are actually number seven, I believe, today, 2022. In 2027, only in four years, four to five years, we will need nine zero eight, 900 battery cell manufacturing capability. What really that means? It's not just you build the machines, you build the capital. We need the commodities for that. And will be really, uh, in, the, in the U.S. still will be uh, you know a distant second in terms of manufacturing these sources of energy as battery. Um, here's a quote directly coming from you know um, um, from I believe it's, it's a, a source original sources USGS and uh, IEA but is put together by visual capitalists. They say that we have to invest about 87 billion. And dollars in the United States just to meet the de de uh, the demand for domestic battery. Um, you know, by by 2030, we're talk talking about 2027, 2030, and with the previous slide we talked about you know 2040. You know, it's very near future. That's what we need. Well, um, you know, thanks to COVID, we come to the realization that the time has changed. The new supply and demand scenario is there. What it tells us that the energy transition will drive the consumption of growth, and this is this morning's news from SNP. Um, in the U.S., um, the demand from the energy transition projects is going forward. Uh, personally, I have noticed in last three, four years how many uh, lithium mining projects, how many 
um, copper projects they were not considered before. Now their investments uh, coming are more uh, player that you would not think about, like you know, small and medium-sized companies, that, you know, going into uh, copper mining, even though you know uh, their investment portfolio is totally different. Um, yes, uh, you know, professionally, I do advise for the investment of mining projects and exploration projects. That's where my my personal data comes from. I see, you know, players that you would not generally expect them to be in the copper uh, copper exploration. I live in, in Utah. I see the, how many companies are exploring the south of my uh, my home here, um, you know, south of Utah for copper. So uh, SNP says, well, you know, we do have that inflation uh, uh, reduction act that is helping to boom this this copper demand in in uh, in US. However, there is a supply response uh, lag. Um, so uh, supply response to lag, that means um, we have a huge demand, but we do not have the mineral or mining projects really to uh, ready to meet that demand. Um, so in my in a previous slide, what I showed you that, you know, um, the we need an a, a enormous amount of uh, um, the, you know, investment in this country to, to uh, meet the, just the demand for the, these new commodities or uh, demand for uh, an, uh, the newly realized amount of material that we need for just for energy transition. Um, now, just look at the 2023, where we, we, we stand. This is exactly what we see, um, the surplus here. Um, and now it's going to thin out, and in around 2026, we'll see a huge deficit and just for copper. This is just for copper. Look at actually why it's important uh, to, to, you know, this discussion is, you know, the geology of mineralization is the location constraint, right? So I'll give an example that, you know, um, here in, in uh, next to Bingham Canyon, Bingham Canyon is a huge uh, producer of copper, gold, and silver. However, um, you won't expect a Bingham Canyon in in uh, in uh, in Nevada. You would expect a lot of copper projects in in Arizona. Just look at how diverse our geology is in the United States. I'll I'll also show you some global perspectives. Um, we know with what we talked about, you know, uh, metallogenic provinces. Um, so basically, is our mining projects is not going to go in places where the deposits occur, right? And the extraction of commodities from the minerals largely depend on where the minerals occur. Um, what really that means, you you would like to put a process plant um, next to a deposit. Uh, but typical, uh, you know, you may have seen a uh, this picture shows uh, a uh, um, um, a plant actually here in uh, uh, in um, uh, eastern um, sorry the the, the uh, is Eastern Nevada. Uh, this is a, a roaster um, that actually um, helps to when that that roaster is is combined with some mineral projects. There, the key of getting those projects in, in, uh, into life is to make that roaster available. That means you need the infrastructure next to the projects. That's the nature of the mining, um, you know, uh, mining uh, mining industry. So. Um, and then you may have heard that there's a new uh, uranium plant is coming in Utah. Um, though, why is that? Because it's all location constraint. And uh, I believe all the geologists listening here, you can relate to the, you know, uh, the fundamental idea is that, you know, they are, the mineral deposits occur where they occur, uh, where they, there is a um, um, the favorable geological conditions, right? So, um, here is um, let's uh, you know we'll discuss more when we when we discuss various commodities in this presentation. Look at the um, uh, the copper projects. They are kind of in the late stage. That means you know it's a these projects is not going to be soft, you know able to supply the the amount of metal that we need in your future. Most of them are in Chile. There are some in U.S. Some in Peru. Um, DRC, there are 
not many producing copper projects, but they will be coming. Here are some of the producing copper projects is coming from SNP. The source is from SNP. Look at actually uh, look at the where um, um, where uh, you know we don't have copper, and we don't have any copper projects in here. We don't have a large number of copper projects to meet the demand uh, in Africa. And there's really great projects in Southern Africa, Southern America, but yet to be, you know, Brazil, the lot of copper projects yet to be uh, coming into production. And that's my opinion based on my own knowledge. Also in Africa, I am aware of some explosion projects. They haven't come to uh, life yet. That means it's really there's a huge lag uh, between supply and demand. Here are the copper occurrences. You know, uh, there are two different types of copper occurrences generally, porphyry type, you know, uh, uh, and the sedimentary hoster, right? Magmatic or sedimentary hoster. Look at the, their, uh, their um, you know, uh, presence there. What you don't see is a large area in Africa yet to be explored. Same actually part of India and also part of South Africa, uh, so, you know, South America yet to be explored for copper. We know there are occurrences, but the, the time hasn't come yet, or, or time has to come that we put in more investment to make those projects uh, into, you know, into producing mines. If just focus on that cluster there that you show that, you know, bunch of things, you know, you know what that is. That is actually the DRC, um, the Zambian copper belt. You know, that just shows how the mining projects are Location and location constrained. Uh, you know they only occur where there's a uh, there's a favorable geological conditions, right? So, you know, I'm just trying to give a sense that we are very proud of being geologists. Like where right now the entire world is realizing the with the uh, with the mining industry the importance of knowing the geology and where the deposits occur and the importance of getting this you know uh, discoveries made and uh, you know having this you know qualified um, qualified uh, 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 you know geologists get into in the industry is important it is very important it's, it's just interest industry actually waking up the whole world is realizing i'm very proud of actually you know being a geologist today all these slides tells me that is is our um, import uh, our um, uh, contribution to the industry is so important. It's so global. Look at the copper in you know, the major discoveries. What where these things have, have happened? Look at Kamoa. We're still talking about Kamoa, right? You know, as, you know, partly producing. You know, yet to go for large scale for produ uh, production. Look, at, we, you know. I taught that Kamoa um, in another scenario. I won't disclose that where I saw, saw you know, toss that that project. You know, had to give my opinion, an expert opinion. Um, you know, there, are the um, this was a large discovery, but we don't see many. We're still talking about the resolution in Arizona. Um, there's two, we are, you know, we are we haven't actually uh, gotten any major discoveries made yet. But if you if you are following the exploration industry, you know that we are in the path of getting a couple of projects coming from various parts of the world. Look at the, the where we're spending the uh, exploration uh, money. Um, U.S. is second or second place in terms of uh, you know uh, budget um, in terms of uh, how much money they're going to spend. Um, in 2022. Basically, that's true in 2023, probably in the next couple of years. It's not going to change a lot, uh, particularly for copper. We know, and you know, I already told you the importance of copper, whether it's battery minerals or not, copper is always going to be there because it is one of the primary metals that we need to transit actually uh, uh, you know, energy from point A to point B. So where we really need, what really, um, uh, I, I stress in various forums is we need to invest more in Africa because we saw that in the last part of it, it need to be explored. And also, uh, you know, even though there is a the 43 percent of the of the material uh, of the of the money is going to be in the Latin America, but there are chunks of Latin America uh, yet to be uh, yet to be fully explored. Remember, this is a, the number of countries are mixed in there. 
particularly Brazil uh, and further southern actually a uh, couple of countries that need actually more exploration activities. But so it's really not uniform. But if we need in US, we have we're spending a little bit of money on exploration. Where are we going to actually get our copper metals? We got to depend from uh, depend on other countries. And um, you know that is that is the current current scenario, whether we like it or not. Um, then I'm going to actually switch to iron ore. Okay, uh, it's my opinion that we need to have steel to make the is this energy. Uh, uh, you know, the, to meet the meet the demand for energy, particularly uh, well, particularly domestic demands. You know, um, industry, industrial demands say different dynamics. We need the steel and aluminum um, in 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 the mix. Uh, so where is actually uh, where are actually iron ores? If if you look at iron ore, you know, large amount of iron ore coming from Africa. Um, here actually eastern uh, sorry eastern Canada and US. But look at actually where this occur and where are the mines. Most of the you know, bigger mines are in Australia, uh, in Brazil, most of them actually uh, large ones are being operated by Vale. Some in, uh, this is actually Anglo-American operating in South Africa, little bit here in the uh, Northeast. But what you see is like tiny little dot there is in Nigeria. Um, yes, I can, I should disclose that I, I was up to last year, World Bank's consultant for uh, developing iron ore deposits in uh, in Nigeria, basically advising their government. If I actually, uh, you know, superimpose uh, those two maps, what I see is that large portion of Africa, there are occurrences of iron ore yet to be, they, these mines have to be developed so that the, the, the demand for steel um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the next decade um, can, can be met. Why? Here, like I said, you know, we know there are not many iron ore projects that's gonna actually, gonna be actually, uh, you know, uh, meet our demand in the United States. We have to get the iron ore from other parts of the world. Okay, uh, towards the end of this, in end of my presentation, you'll see the, you know what we're talking about today about the, uh, in, interdependency between different economies. Here is our position in iron ore production. Uh, like we said, you know, US only produces less than 50 million tons. Uh, this is a bit dated, but we haven't improved much. The, our iron ore uh, mines in, in Northern US um, is, is kind of, uh, uh, is, is not as really growing at, at a, uh, at a uh, pace uh, that would really be uh, sustainable to meet the demand for, for steel. Uh, for domestic and industrial uses. Um, most of the, like, like you saw in the map, is coming, uh, coming from, most of the iron is coming from Australia. Brazil, China, there are good, actually, you know, there is a big dynamics there. Uh, you can import and export. India is a totally different animal here. Totally different animal. You won't actually hear India actually exporting iron ore because they're, they have a huge demand for consumption within their country. So that's kind of gone out of the equation. If we need steel, we have to depend on other, um, other countries, particularly look at South Africa is doing, doing okay there, but there are many other African countries. Um, I, I believe we can, um, we can actually, if we strategically invest, then we can actually um, get the, uh, meet the demand for the steel in our country. Um, mixing, uh, again, like I said, this is a kind of a missing um, in the mix of for, for demand for uh, metals uh, and the other commodities we need for uh, battery industry and overall electrical industry. Um, this is the, again, I'm highlighting that country is Nigeria. Um, you know, that is, you won't see the statistics even anywhere in the, in, in, in the world. Um, from my own experience, there is, a, um, 1 billion plus tons of material sitting there, but that number, please don't quote me <laughs> because there is not a full uh, fledged exploration done yet, but this is kind of a analyst's view. Um, you know, how much material, uh, how much iron ore can potentially be mined from Nigeria itself. It's, it's, it's a large territory uh, with iron ore, uh, not very good grade, but 
okay grade um kind of you know uh, not comparable with uh, with uh, brazilian iron ore or some of the good iron ores in australia but very comparable with the, the, the iron ore that we get from india or uh, chinese a little bit um and also a little bit of uh, iron ore here in the us so there are new territories coming maybe you know again is it geological constrained we know where they are we need to you know work on how do how do we see get these materials uh, to meet the demand for those commodities. Look at the aluminum, where they occur. Actually, there are three different types that we know, particularly lateritic bauxites. Look at the, where these are all Amazonians, right? Lateritic bauxite deposits, right? In a, a large amount of bauxite in here in, in India, Africa, um, Brazil, um, Indonesia, huge uh, resources in here. And then we get, get the cars bauxites in here, um, but they are not really big producers. Um, uh, they're not really big producers there, but we have actually those occurrences there. And also um, there are some minor uh, uh, ones like in, in, in uh, Siberian uh, uh, peninsula there and some of the East Europe, Europe, Europe also. Um, but the major aluminum um, that's coming from, is gonna come from, uh, South America, part of Africa, yet to be explored. Actually, what the dots you are seeing, actually, if you look at the uh, the bauxite deposits, we're all talk about Guinea, not other countries. Actually, there are lots of other deposits yet to be explored, uh, yet to be actually uh, explored and also put into 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 project uh, into uh, mineable projects. Um, Indonesians doing great. But we're yet to actually, you know, uh, look at also other, um, you know, smaller territories, but large deposits of bauxite. Nickel, the same way. If you look at the deposits there, we're talking about lateral nickels also here in Brazil, um, and uh, a, a large chunk of nickels actually here here in Africa. Um, they're not uniformly uh, distributed. You know, we hear about nickel a couple of years ago when you know one of the car manufacturers you know disclosed that they need nickel. Now you see the nickel projects coming in uh, some of the Canadian territories. Um, some of the nickel projects coming there. Um, some some big ones actually coming from Indonesia. Um, uh, I I don't hear a lot from Australia as much I would like to, um, but there, you know some. Uh, Projects coming from eastern part of India, actually the state originally I come from, there's large lateral nickel deposits in there. You would also, you should actually see here Colombian nickel projects. Uh, I think the BSP was trying to uh, uh, develop that. I do not know current status where this, the studies really um, stands today. Um, but nickel is one of those commodities that we need. Without nickel, you know, the battery or the energy sector cannot really go further based on today's technology that we have. Um, so this is, again, location constrained, need to need more exploration for nickel because there's a huge demand for that. If you look at the, I think I, I already presented this one, where the nickel mines are, is mostly Indonesia, Brazil, a uh, little bit of uh, in, in Canada, but there are more actually uh, in pipeline. If you look at the sulfide and lateritic deposits, I, you know, these are all lateritic deposits. What really that means, we got to focus based on the known, um, you know, exploration territories. What we know, you know, metallogenic provinces, very much, you know, geology dependent. Right? Is another example. Um, again, cobalt. And we talk about cobalt again. Uh, there are a lot of copper cobalt projects. Uh, we uh, we know uh, here actually, you know, this African couple, uh, cobalt uh, provinces. We talk a lot about it. But the big big supply is actually U.S. We are really um, good in um, you know uh, good in uh, copper copper uh, cobalt supply because we have a lot of sedimentary hosted uh, copper cobalt deposits. However, there's a large chunk of magnet, magmatic uh, uh, in a complex deposits in Brazil, uh, also in Canada. We know, we talk about the Eastern Canada, you know the. Uh, um, you know, those projects coming and there are also more um, projects. I, I'm thinking that in the second quarter of this year, we we'll hear more um, polymetallic deposits like nickel, cobalt uh, type of deposits, uh, deposits being developed um, in part of Canada and also Europe. Um, 
again, um, Cobalt actually, you know, type of different couple of Cobalt projects. If you look at the reserve, most of what we talk about these these dots, the DRC, uh, right? And uh, most of the reserve is there. But I think this chart is going to change. This chart has to change because it's once we put actually um, more mind to produce, this chart should actually change. We need to have more Canadian uh, projects, you know, you know, going into production so that you know the demand for cobalt can be met also uh, you see um, the cobalt even though it occurs in us a lot but we happen to you know made actually many cobalt projects coming into pipeline there are only two of them you know and they are in uh, historic mining districts in the in us i know um, you know the other sides of the story too in these two projects, but there are a lot more um, in uh, in uh, in US yet to be uh, uh, fully explored and and you know making their ways to become producing mines. Um, um, so what we discussed so far, you know, taking the examples of copper, cobalt, uh, iron, bauxite, um, all these metals, you can take, take actually other metals too in the mix. I intentionally didn't discuss lithium because there's a lot of information about lithium, but just look at these major commodities. We, um, we uh, are in a situation at a, at a time frame where we try to develop as many domestic uh, metals as we can. However, there are the regional hubs that are coming uh, where they will in a more process plants will be uh, and metal production uh, kind of hubs uh, hubs uh, are emerging uh, i don't know if i have a yeah here are some regional hubs coming actually uh, you see the lithium and nickel and cobalt if you look at there will be couple in 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 uh, nickel projects uh, sorry nickel manufacturing capabilities will be there in different parts of the world and also in cobalt um, if you look at there are only two or three or four of them are gonna come uh, in uh, in uh, uh, near future. So these kind of emerging trends. We talk about you know supply chain and uh, and also the other one is you know supply and demand dynamics. So this is also a new thing coming our way. We as the geologists, it's it becomes you know kind of our responsibility, I guess, is to let and help the mining industry. Uh, you know, to uh, in 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 getting the more exploration projects and you know um, into into uh, into productions uh, to meet this you know uh, demand from this new uh, newly emerging hubs and newly emerging actually supply chain dynamics. Another one actually um, is we recognize that there are newer players. I show this chart from Nigeria simply because I had association with uh, through World Bank. Um, I know and uh, you know what they are what they are capable of producing and kind of playing a role at least in that part of Africa. Um, you know there's all, there's demand for all these commodities not just in US throughout the world. The world has changed, as we see. So they will play a big role. If you look at the list of the commodities they're they're uh, you know thinking of uh, developing, uh, there's copper, cobalt, and some industrial minerals that is strategically uh, putting an investment to make those uh, projects uh, you know uh, going into production. Um, in I don't know maybe in next ten years or so, but some of them are in, in very advanced stage. So there are new players, we got to recognize that. The government policies and public participation is very, 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 very important. Um, because of the, uh, because of the, uh, of the new, you know, new dynamics there, um, the international nature of the industry, the governments need to work, work on various ways for supporting the supply of the commodities and in a soft, and also support this sustainable supply of the, of this, uh, uh, you know, um, sustainably develop the, these projects uh, in a way that uh, you know um, that we the we can support the humanity, not just one country, the whole world. Because this is a, this is a new scenario. This is uh, December 2022. Uh, I don't know if, if you know if you have seen this picture. This is U.S. Africa uh, Leader Summit uh, Summit. Never happened. Never happened before. 
Why? Is is the focus is in the invest U.S. investment in Africa's critical minerals. You know, um, I'll share a story. Um, I was trying to get on the plane into go to Nigeria in early 2022. I think January, February. The day before uh, get my, uh, you know, um, the day before my travel uh, on the radio, I heard about the trip of uh, U.S. leaders in in Nigeria. It's like when that happened, I never heard that in last 10 years. They never visited that country. It's, the focus is how we get these commodities from other countries. That means it's not that it's not that we will get all the commodities by when we ship it. To, to our country, uh, what do we need? Rather have access to those countries, those commodities in different parts of the world. But what we realize is that deposits occur and, and the occurrences of those, those deposits heavily controlled by geology. And uh, they are controlled by geology. It's not that partially controlled by the geology. It is the, it is the geology that guides it. So just imagine that what the policymakers should be focusing on. It should be all scientific policymaking, right? There should be science in the policymaking. They need to recognize it that, you know, um, we just cannot expect to have copper from Canada, all the, all the copper that we need from Canada, because copper Canada cannot supply all that. Right, it just shows that you know, and we cannot produce all the copper that we need in, in the United States. Same for steel, we need the steel in, in, in the United States. And why are you gonna get it? Uh, hypothetically speaking, if we help another South African country that has uh, in occurrences of this iron, um, iron bearing minerals, can we help them to, to develop it so that we have access to it? So once we have access to those commodities, then we can get it. Remember, geology is the king. Um, we need, there is need for strategic investment, isn't it? So I think this quote, I already quoted this number, US will need to invest about $87 billion um, and also Europe, uh, there was Europe quoted, I looked at the, uh, the uh, Europe part there to meet the domestic uh, demand just for battery, uh, uh, demand for, for battery, uh, um, um, uh, you know, to manufacture batteries in, in this country. And battery would think about just for energy, but we need these commodities for other parts of the life that we are already used to. Um, where this, it is my opinion that what this investment should be, we already are investing in mine that, like I said, we are already seeing the an explosion growing in various parts of the parts of uh, US. You know, uh, you know, I was surprised to see that a lithium process coming in Texas. I'd like when that happened. But when I saw the geology, I said, well, this doesn't surprise me. You know, well, lithium projects would come from Texas. Texas will probably become another hub for mining uh, one day pretty, pretty soon. So investment need to be in the mining projects. There is government role that we know. Um, manufacturing has to be, uh, we need to invest in the manufacturing that means we need infrastructure uh, uh, so that we can actually put the plants. Also, to just to put the plants, we need metals. So it's kind of circular, isn't it? There's a demand for the metals, and we need the uh, need the plants that would, that just to construct the plants. We need the metals. So there need to be huge stress on how do we uh, make the manufacturing more smart, and so that uh, you know, like creating hubs. We are already seeing that in in the gold industry. Uh, particularly in the Western US, um, and where we make the hubs for manufacturing uh, parts of, of the gold industry. I think similar things are emerging globally. Uh, we need to invest in there. This is my passion, actually, where, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this webinar too. Educate, educate, educate. Whoever you can, educate your neighbor, educate your lawmaker. Please, we play our own roles as a geologist. We are, we have the power now. This is my personal view. We need to invest a lot in education and training. Some of the part of the $87 billion of investment should come, uh, should come to this part too. I know that we're doing, but it's just a little bit. We're just doing a little bit. Um, but I think there is more stress need to be there. Why? As we know, the uh, profession of economic geologist, there's a huge demand for that. But today, we're not producing that many economic geologists. But that relates to where um, you know, our demand is. 
you see, I live in US, uh, in, in Utah, but I go to different parts of the world because there's a need for that, um, that uh, you know, uh, level of um, um, in a in a training that level of knowledge that we need to develop the mineral deposits in different parts of the world. So we are already in in, a, in an area where our influence is very very influential um, in, in the international market. And we we just need to do more. I think that's all I have. Uh, we have roughly about twenty minutes to take questions. Uh, Aaron. Thank you, Abani, for a wonderful uh, uh, talk today. Uh, I, I, I'd like to start us off with a question and then we can maybe dig into the chat. Um, you talked a lot about things that we might do, uh, things that we might want to try to put forward as geologists. What, if I could put you on the spot, what are three opportunities you see for geologists right now? So if you're an early career geologist and you're looking for the big opportunities, what would you recommend these early career folks uh, think about pursuing? Oh, <clears throat> well, fantastic, really brilliant question. And Aaron, uh, I'm not kidding that I get these questions also, you know, from LinkedIn to, you know, on my personal email. That's why I disclose my phone number also, and the people write to me on WhatsApp, right? It, it's a good question. Um, so I'm going to give you the same answer what I give to other people, even to the professors too. Uh, I ask students um, or the early career geologists to, um, be serious actually what they want to do. That means uh, first um, talk to your mentors. Who your first mentor is your professor where you're graduating. Also expose yourself to the industry people so that you know where you want to contribute. Today, there's equal demand for, um, um, equal demand for research. And um, as, it, as there's a demand for in, in, in industry. So early career geologists, they should really choose to, they should actually select where they wanna go. But if there's a change they wanna make, they can always make that. For example, a, a geologist, if he chooses to go to industry, he should not, he, 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 there's no way that he, you know, if he doesn't like it, he can always switch back to the research. It's possible, it's not easy, but it's possible. But they should stick to, stick to the discipline they like. You know, if they want to they come to economic mining, mining industry, there's ample opportunity. There's a lot of industry, you know, uh, opportunity out there. They first thing first, talk to the people. You know, if you do, you, you know, an early college geolo geologist doesn't have a huge network. I think Aaron, um, uh, again, how they get the network is they need to be active in uh, societies like AIPG, or uh, GSL, let's say, or SME, you know, get uh, more advices from senior people and then make their own decisions where they wanna go. And always the second uh, advice I would give them, ask, because I was there, Aaron, you will be there, many, many of us were there when we didn't have answer to all the questions we had. Ask for the help that will be there. Is that, did I answer your question, Aaron? Sure, absolutely. Um I see a question from Carol Orr. She has, she has several here, and I'm going to try to maybe uh, condense them. Um, could, you, could you talk about risk, uh, cost, investment, and say the timeline to go from exploration to proving Ooh. your resource to producing resource? Can you give us an idea of how that works? And, and you know, who pays for that? Uh, is it usually companies? Um, do governments step in and assist? And how might that work? Uh, who is, where is this question coming from? Uh, from Carol Orr. It's uh, in the chat, uh, just up from the bottom. She, she asked several questions, and I just wanted okay. to try to, so, or, or they asked several questions. I just wanted to condense them a bit. Okay. So <clears throat> mining in, in mining industry, um, investment can come, um, uh, come from various sources. Um, the, if you have, if, you know, you don't see... Just look at actually what the exploration really happens and by whom. There are, if, they, if it is a junior exploration company, there are tons of them that are active in various parts of parts of US. They always get support from outside financing companies. Now, who are these outside financing companies? It can be just investment firms. They, they play a big chunk of, uh, they, they play a big role there. 
recently what we're seeing and you know it was always there but we're seeing it's actually it's kind of growing um, uh, more and more larger mining companies invest in in the in the junior uh, exploration companies uh, projects provided the exploration project uh, has a promise um, enough it, it, it's, it's kind of promiseable um, project that means um, at the, what's, they are at a certain stage that fits to the investment portfolio of a, of, a, of a larger mining company. Just for an example, let's say Rio Tinto Exploration, where they can actually show interest, where they will show interest, where you know a project is developing and they see that that project will fit to their portfolio, right? They know their strength, what they're going to do. Freeport McMurray, let's say, or Newmont, what they're going to actually invest. They will invest also in another company's, another junior's uh, exploration project. If they see that when that project comes live, they can you know operate it. So um, is that I think Aaron, the multi-part question. I think investment part is 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 coming from mainly two sources: major mining companies and investment community. But timeline-wise, I think that dynamics have changed. Timeline was it was like 10 to 20 years, depending on the size of the project. Size is a big deal, how big a project it is. Now you may have heard about resolution copper. Um, you know, I was, you know, I worked on that project few years actually. And if you look at the website, you know, um, you know, you see that when it's gonna be coming live because of size and, the, and it's gonna be underground project. That's huge. Compare that with a smaller project coming in the south side of US, in the south side of Utah, um, they won't take that long. Now, that dynamic is also changing now. If you have a good investor, they believe in exploration and they have patience, they know that you know, return uh, on investment is not going to be quick. It will going to take time. So if you are an exploration company, choose the, you know, who is going to be a partner. I learned that in, in a hard way. It's not just any investment. You find an investment partner. That means they do what they believe in your philosophy, they believe in your project, they believe in your work style. So you can work together. That means you know you're making this project going from exploration to mining. So today I'm hearing about six years to 10 years, sometimes, you know, if you're doing a real scientific exploration. The other variable in this is the jurisdiction where you're developing project. Um, again, this five, six years to 10, 12 years from this small to mid-sized projects is probably, um, um, probably uh, you know, uh, these are coming from the, uh, you know, uh, from the jurisdictions like US, Canada, Australia, where, you know, there's the, the regulations are different, their expectations are different. But if you're developing a project, um, also, that is true in India. Um, they, you're developing a project in in uh, in um, northern Africa and southern Africa. There are two different types of uh, dynamics there too. That timeline may not matter. Okay, that timeline can be very very short, very very short. Depends exactly what kind of investment package you are bringing there. You may be seeing into some junior companies from Canada. They're developing already gold projects in other parts of uh, parts of uh, Africa. You'll probably, if you'll hear probably more of that in PDAC uh, this year and uh, next month. So uh, uh, in March, early March. So they're coming into life at a record time frame simply because those government play a role in, in influencing the, you know, this exploration project in a positive way. So it's not really, I cannot give you a straightforward answer, but these are all different variables coming to play. I see we have one more question. This is from Robert North and it, it addresses the political climate around mining. As we know, uh, sometimes we face, uh, as, as Mr. North would say, headwinds, uh, sometimes from people who uh, live in the area but don't uh, see a great benefit from mining. Uh, sometimes people do see a benefit, but they object to the, the projects, things like Rosemont or Pebble or even Resolution down in Arizona. Um, how do we as geologists help address the political I concern? Know. It is, you know, this morning, you know, uh, I'm not being political at all. I mean, we heard the action by EPA on the paper. Okay, I'll let the listener explore that. Um, as like what's going on in there. But I'm hearing about paper for many years now, actually. I think I tossed that as, a, as an independent consultant. 
some sometimes and look at the potential. I think our role it is twofold. It's my my opinion. One, first one, educate people on science. It's not political. Stay away from politics. Educate people on science. That means if you develop this project today, it's going to benefit you in the future. I do that at, at a personal level. Uh, I'll give an example. I think whose question was that, James? No. Um, um, so addressing the whole audience here, I go to the you know the uh, capital building here in in uh, in Utah just myself because I see that you know if, if I don't do it, I if I'm going to depend on someone else, no one is going to do it actually. If, if you're going to think that hey someone else is going to do it, so take that as a responsibility. Can we educate a person today? I think that's one thing that we can do. The other part, actually, what you talked about is the what we're globally thinking about. You know uh, how to change that. You know license to operate. That's you can you know discuss that under the umbrella of ESG. And that's a global uh, global kind of movement happening. A part of that movement is also education. Educate people. Let people know that the benefit from mine. However, there is also a risk. I'm not saying mining is a risk for industry. It has a risk two ways, both actually both ways. One is tangible risk, which is environmental that everyone talks about it. But many of them are just theories. They're not, they are not happening yet. Or they are not no proof. There's a fear factor. We as a scientist, can we take the responsibility of educating people so that they their opinion based on science only? not just like what we, you know, like the, you know, uh, non-scientific information out there, there are tons of them. The, so on the environmental side, of course, if this is a real environmental issue, we need to, uh, un, you know, keep a balance there. That's also our responsibility. Not that, not that you know, we are jealous, we've got to, like, you know, get the mining industry going, but we cannot also compromise on the, uh, on our response, uh, on, on the environmental aspects of mining industry. It's happening in DRC, in African countries, you've been a, given a good example there. Um, you know, resolution is a whole, in my opinion, it's, it's a political issue. It's not a scientific issue. And I have dealt with that you know, on the side. I'm a research geologist. Today's research geologists are required to think about ESG. Um, so I've dealt with that a little bit. Um, you know, take the politics out, bring the, let the science speak. I think you know there's a lot of good projects will come come uh, come into life. I think that's um, um, I think I don't know. I think that that's what I should stop my comment on that topic, right? Because it can go in a whole different tangent. Sure. All right. We have a question from James Stroud, and and I'm going to address the first piece. James asks, sure. can or will this presentation uh, be shared with our nation's politicians? The really nice thing about AIPG as an organization is that while we're a not-for-profit, we're organized in such a way that we can we can reach out to politicians and try to address political concerns. So certainly this presentation can be shared with politicians. The second part of James's question is, uh, would you say that the lack of mining and exploration in the United States is due to cost mostly uh, equated to land use restrictions, uh, things like zoning and then the permitting process? Um, I think it has three or four prongs. Actually, first is cost for sure, but if you look at what the cost coming from, because we have been very responsible country in developing our research. I'm very proud of that. Actually, you know, people, when I go to different parts of the world, people say, you know, in, in US it's not developing. I say, well, if I bring those law, those rules and regulations, how careful we are, how environmentally responsible we are, you bring those standards in any country, it's gonna take time because we are responsible miners in US. As, and I give credit to our friends in Canada and Australia too. I know they do, to do operate. Cost is a, is a big deal. Um, for sure, and land use zoning. I think you know um, that is a uh, kind of an administrative type of a problem. We do have that problem, but it's not the only problem. And uh, we we can bring the ESG into picture. Um, yes, we got to be responsible, but that has to be a balance. Just for the you know the sake of uh, you know saying you know it's an environmental issue. We 
don't let the mining process go. I don't buy that. I would I believe in you know in a collaboration, having good discussion with with all parties, you know, all stakeholders come and have a discussion. When you have a multilateral discussion, many problems go away. Really, you see that those are perceived problems. They're not real problems, actually. So um, our timeline is actually constrained by multiple factors. Like there's not just one. OK, that, that's a great lead into what I think is going to be our last question. Um, and it's, it's a thorny question. Uh, we know that mining has an impact. And we know that often uh, we have very significant environmental concerns. We can talk about uh, something like uh, if you go into south uh, southeast Missouri, uh, we have pretty good evidence that there's a very large, maybe 60% of the Viburnum trend size lead zinc mm -hmm. deposit there, but it's under the Ozark National Scenic Riverway. So there's a great potential for concern. The, the question is, how do we balance these concerns with this increased um, demand for metals. This question come, comes from Kyle Ross, and I want to give Kyle credit for that, uh, that we're going to see as we transition to a lower carbon economy. That means we're going to have to have more metals. So how do we balance that? Is it technology? Do we look at different source locations by expanding our exploration? Or is there something else out there that we're not thinking of? Um, I don't know. All three of them. Fossil technology. And if you see the, what technology is doing today, um, Technology is helping us to become smart. I define smart different ways. I define smart is it's a simple, but gets your work done at a timely and efficient manner. It got to be simple. That's my first criteria. Technology making our lives easier and uh, making it smarter in terms of both in finding the minerals. You know, you can think of you know, all the algorithms happening today, you know, use of um, you know, artificial intelligence and everything else. That is just to um, why those things are happening. If you look at it, look at the, who are the investors there, we were trying to get this more uh, more knowledge available and interpretation done more rapidly. That's where it is. Um, you know, all the technology is helping, but also um, um, you know uh, there is what where else actually with technology helping? If you look at the uh, research going on mostly in, in Asian countries, Japan. Uh, some of them Singapore, there's always people trying to find what is the alternate choice. That means if I don't have access to cobalt, it's an alternate choice for, for cobalt that we have. That research to me, uh, it's more metallurgical chemical type of research that is never ending. That will continue to happen. Parallel to that, how do you find more resources using technology and also uh, keeping a balance between, in, between environment and you know, basically, again, technology is helping us actually. But again, you cannot, you can, you have to bring always the education part of it, just so that you know we let the people know. Like you know, we talked about that cobalt project in Vibranum train and the other cobalt project project coming. I think in Nadao or something. You know, there are a lot of complaints. But can we bring all the stakeholders together? Say, hey, we have a new technology. We have a new type of mind planning that's going to help the environment to restore it. What happened in the past is we're not going to repeat it. It's basically winning the trust of the, of the people. I think that's where um, the key is. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm glad. I think I'm pretty sure AIPG is also recognizing uh, uh, international organizations like ICMM. Um, they're very kind of now proactively working on those type of things. It, it, did I answer a question, Aaron, or is there another strength to uh, this question? Uh, you, you did. It's a wonderful, it was a wonderful talk today. I, I did see there was one more question on mining seawater, and, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to get to that. Uh, <laughs> but as a geochemist myself, um, I, I do think that in the long term, you know, one of the things that we'll see is um, when demand rises to enough that the price point is there, yes. we're going to see seawater as a source. I, I think there's no doubt about that. It's not going to be for every metal, but it's certainly going to be for some. Well, oh, yeah, one of the prime examples, actually, in, in a different way, just to say, uh, if think about, Aaron, about the energy mix. About 10 years ago, we thought renewable, renewable energy is going to actually meet probably 50, 60 percent of the demand. Is it really? Realistically speaking, there'll be a good mix of the sources of energy. 
Similarly, there are the good source of for commodities coming from various sources. But I think, Aaron, as, as the, this is where the technology comes in a, in a forefront, actually, is the sea water. You also hear about SPS, seabed authorities, you now what they're talking about, the manganese noodles and stuff. These, are, these are all will be sources of commodities, but there will be a balance. I think right now we are, we are in a very volatile uh, time. But we're just trying to figure out what, what's going to be in the future. Well, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Samal, I, I really do appreciate your time today. I thought it was a wonderful talk, and I thank you for that. I would like to let everyone know that next month, uh, the last Tuesday in February, uh, past AIPG President Matt Rhodes will be here, and he's going to give us uh, some insight into the nuts and bolts and do's and don'ts of running a drilling program. It'll be a very different uh, presentation, but it should be fantastic. So once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Samal, for your time, energy, and effort on our behalf. I truly appreciate it. Uh, and with that, uh, we will end our webinar. Thank you. I really appreciate I enjoyed this, uh, this presentation here today. Thank you.